everybody, and welcome to the Paranormal Portal. I'm your host, Brent Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got an epic show ahead, but just remember, if any of you have experiences you'd like to share, I'd love to hear from you. You can either email me at paranormalportalradio at gmail.com or head over to paranormalportal.net. Scroll down and find the button that says interview me, and that'll allow you to look at a calendar of possible times and dates and uh, find a date that works for you. Love to hear your stories, so definitely get in touch with me. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Hope you guys are doing great, and thank you so much for the support. We are just about to dive into one of the shows that I've been really excited to get to, and uh, we finally lined everything up, and we are about to talk to Mr. Alexander Petikoff, who is here to discuss his incredible series of shows, uh, Bigfoot Beyond the Trail, as well as his other projects. And uh, we're going to dive right into it, so let's get going. Hey, Alex, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me on, Brent. I appreciate it. Oh, it's completely my pleasure. I've uh, been a longtime fan of what you're doing. I've been watching Beyond the Trail, I think, pretty close to when it first came out. Wow. And the, all the work you guys have done, all the ground you've covered, and it's a hell of a journey. And I, I first of all, I got to compliment you on not only what you're doing, but how well you're doing it. You really bring the viewer into the experience, and and your show really does stand uh, uh, all by itself as far as the quality of what you're doing and how well you're doing it. But I guess the biggest question I have is right off the bat is kind of my go to, but. Where did this start for you? Sure, yeah, and I appreciate the kind words. Uh, means a lot, uh, and thank you for bearing with me. I know it's been uh, <laughs> we've been talking about this for a few months, but I was, sure. you know, as, as we've been talking about before, I was in Alaska for about a month and a half, uh, and just on that journey, so it was a little tough to get times pinned down for, for interviews and that sort of thing. But um, again, thanks for having me on, and uh, yeah, the journey started, I guess, just. I've always been interested in these mysterious topics ever since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, I guess my dad told me about the story of the Yeti in the Himalayas and a family ski trip at one point. And something about that story just made me think, you know, looking up in the mountains and saying, well, there's this thing has to be out there. And that sparked a fascination that carried on throughout, uh, you know, my childhood and then into uh, later years of life, you know, when I was a teen and then into college, I didn't really care so much about the topic. And then, Finding Bigfoot actually kind of rekindled my interest, as I think it did a lot of folks. Yes. Uh, and then I decided to kind of start getting out myself and uh, like, hey, I want to do documentaries on these topics. And I started doing that. Um, and uh, one thing led to another. And, you know, almost a decade later, here we are, uh, you know, talking about this series that we've been doing now for a couple of years. So it's kind of been a lifelong interest, I suppose, that's just sort of um, manifested into this journey, I suppose. It's an, it's an incredible journey, and, and and I think it's really exciting. I think you're right uh, about the Finding Bigfoot thing. That was certainly, I think, my christening into the subject matter. Uh, you know, other, way, other than having just a vague awareness that there was Bigfoot out there, but, I mean, Finding Bigfoot really opened up the scope of it to me. I'd really thought that it was this Pacific Northwest thing that happened and, and maybe is happening, but... I was really shocked to find out this is truly a global phenomena. Yeah, there does seem to be, uh, you know, quite a few reports. And as I mentioned, you know, what originally got me into it was the Yeti. So yeah. that was even one that was known in the Himalayas prior to the common knowledge, let's say, of Bigfoot or Sasquatch here in North America. You had post-World War II, the stories of the abominable snowman, right? Mm -hmm. Yeti, and that kind of became ingrained culturally. And then you had these stories from the Pacific Northwest coming out of the Sasquatch, which is more of the kind of Canadian term. Mm -hmm. And then Bigfoot in the late 1950s, of course, with those infamous tracks down in Bluff Creek, Jerry Crew and that whole kind of story. And the rest is history, as they say. Uh, so it, it, and now, you know, you have so many festivals and so many events about it across North America. I mean, I've been to events in British Columbia and Florida, Ohio, uh, Maine, you name it. There's places now that are kind of embracing they're local monsters because a lot of times you see some of these local communities have stories of the Falk monster or wood devils or 
a big muddy monster or whatever the case may be in these local areas that are there are even sometimes monikers of creatures that predate the common Bigfoot or Sasquatch craze that started in the 60s and 70s and has, you know, kind of regained steam now. Uh, these things sort of, I mean, even just now I'm holding a book written by my friend Les Odell here, uh, Old Man of the Mountain from mm-hmm. West Virginia. Uh, and he just sent me this and that in West Virginia they called him the Old Man of the Mountain. You know, these hairy creatures that live up there. And that's a name that predates that kind of Bigfoot Sasquatch sort of thing. So, uh, it's interesting how it's kind of come in waves, the popularity of it, and it's died down, then come back, and you have pivotal moments like we talked about with Finding Bigfoot, mm-hmm. really, I think, cementing that this is not just going on in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Or even at the time, you had the Pacific Northwest, and you had, like, Arkansas, Falk Monster, Legend of Boggy Creek, maybe Skunk Ape stuff. You'd be lucky to hear about those sorts of things, Florida and elsewhere. It really is still, a lot of people think it's, Pacific Northwest, but uh, you know, I'm I'm here from the Northeast, from uh, New Hampshire in the, in the New England area, and there's a long history of stuff in this area too. Uh, and I don't think it gets a lot of coverage, and people don't know a lot about it. And it's still kind of a tight lit sort of thing that uh, you have to know the right people for them to tell you their stories. Otherwise, they get very standoffish and you know won't share stories until after right. they're retired. And mm-hmm. a lot of the kind of common stuff you see with witnesses throughout the sort of paranormal topics, I suppose. Uh, people don't want to be seen as crazy. Sure. Um, yeah. Especially if they work out in the woods daily, you know, and they see an eight-foot-tall ape man. That's not something they're exactly going to be willing to talk about. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And it just it just goes to show how widespread it is. And, I mean, there are still so many pockets of North America and parts of Asia that are so remote. Um, I know even parts of Southeast Asia that they're discovering new species all the time largest caves in the world. I mean, discovered within the last decade or so in places like Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. And uh, you think about just how much war and conflict happened there. I mean, and still things are being discovered. So you have North America. I mean, having just fresh off the heels of driving from the East coast all the way to Alaska. And I've seen everything kind of in between aside from that whole lot of nothing you have in the Midwest where it's all just flat cornfields and, and cows, you have that entire <laughs> stretch from Canada up to Alaska that is so vastly remote yeah. and how much space there is, it's actually kind of frightening to think about it. I mean, you could go drive a mile or two off of the Alaska Highway and never be seen again. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we're you know sticking to that one strip of civilization that takes us from one place to another, but there's just a whole lot of nothing in between. So uh, you, you see that and it kind of gives you perspective. Of, yeah, there's something easily could be out here. Oh, yeah. One one thing that I think is fascinating, and this is, it kind of occurred to me as I've been doing this show, it was like, I, I wonder, and, and maybe just see what you think of this, but I, I, I know that there were all these different names, wild man, grass man, old man of the mountain, boogers, wood boogers, yowies, you know, and, and so on and so forth. But I think that for the longest time, people considered those very regional phenomena, and it wasn't until there was a unifying term, the Bigfoot. And and right. people suddenly, it, and it became big news, and, and newspapers would talk about it and, you know, across the country, that maybe it was at that point when all these regional terms started to be like, oh, well, we got those here. We got those here, but we call it, at, you know. And, and so suddenly, instead of having all these regional areas of incidents with these, uh, you know, anomalies or these phenomena that suddenly it was like, oh my gosh, you know, they're everywhere. So uh, it seemed like it took a term like Sasquatch or Bigfoot to tie that all together. Would you agree with that? I do. I actually would. Yeah. I think I've noticed that too, just throughout some of the areas I've been to and especially here on the East coast, where we have some of these older stories of wild men and older. I mean, I, I recently have come across a, newspaper report from an area very local to me where, you know, these boys were scared off by a gorilla while hunting in the 1890s. And it's just sort of kind of really interesting, that description. Uh, and because you usually have wild man and that sort of thing. But sure. yeah, I think sometimes you have unique phenomena, unique creatures, stuff like goat man, other real, the Jersey devil, that are sort of these standalone type things. Right. But more often than not, a lot of these local monsters like, Again, I, I could list off a dozen different names. The Mogollon Monster, the Mogollon Rim in Arizona, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of a pre-Bigfoot sort of term uh, uh, described by Boy Scouts and people hiking in this kind of mountainous region of Arizona. 
what do they describe? It's a tall, hairy kind of creature that throws rocks at you and yells at nights and runs around your camp. I mean, what does that sound like, right? So right. you kind of have this compendium of reports from across North America, and there seems to be behavioral traits yeah. that are pretty common, right, in terms of the reports. So something like that, yes, it's its own unique sort of story and a folklore of Mogan Monster, but the way it's described seems to fit very well into this larger kind of Bigfoot Sasquatch type uh, story. It's kind of a piece of the mosaic, I suppose. So, mm-hmm. um, and again, I mean, just a local one for me here, Wood Devils, I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. is a story from, you know, the late 1800s in northern New Hampshire, which is kind of the Great Woods North region towards the Canadian border. Um, you know, very sparsely populated, a lot of trees. There's probably more moose than human beings in that area. <laughs> and you have these stories going back of these things called Wood Devils. Mm-hmm. Uh, where they were described as they were tall, hairy, to be covered in grayish hair, and they could stand behind a tree, and you could almost walk into one before seeing it. Mm-hmm. And there were also stories of the bears that howled at night in the mountains, um, you know, which black bears are not really known to do. So there's all these sorts of stories that kind of and behaviors that are very interesting. A lot of times they do become the local boogeyman type story. Sure. Uh, so, you know, you have, oh, uh, don't go into the woods too far past camp or the wood, wood devils will get you at night. That's something I've I've been told by people who grew up in that region. Um, but again, it's like when you add it to that larger sort of narrative, and I think there is the case of sometimes where Bigfoot researchers will just attribute anything like the wow. Wendigo stories, right? They'll say, well, that's probably they're just describing a Bigfoot. Sure. Which I don't necessarily agree with. I think that's kind of its own thing. Mm-hmm. That's like, you know, saying, uh, I've even heard, you know, like the lizard man of Scape or Swamp is described as, well, it was just a misidentified Bigfoot. Uh, I know that's common with the Dogman stuff now. Sure. So, you know, I don't get a lot into that, but I know there seems to be something going on. But right. um, I don't know. I've only got one report of a person that claims they saw Bigfoot, but it fits more of like Dogman description. Oh, yeah. Which then kind of makes me wonder, was it a bear? I mean, it was scratching its back up against a tree. Oh. I don't know. Uh, it's interesting. But uh, I think then you look back at the Native American and the First Nations kind of perspectives. And, you know, that's not something I can necessarily speak to. But uh, just I know I can only really speak from my personal experiences with some of these tribes across North America. And mm-hmm. just a few months ago, being in British Columbia and talking to the uh, the New Hulk tribe, which lives in coastal British Columbia, a place called Bella Coola. If you've seen the, uh, I think it was the Edward Norton Hulk um, in that movie. At the end of the movie, he's hiding out in a cabin in remote British Columbia. That actually happens to be in that little oh. uh, a little part of British Columbia. It's a coastal region, so it's very similar to the habitats you have basically from northern California to southern Alaska. It's that temperate rainforest, very mm-hmm. lush, where bulk of the Sasquatch reports come from. I mean, it's a fabulous habitat. And, uh, you know, talking to that tribe there, they actually took us to a... 12,000-year-old petroglyph site, which has these creatures called the Sninics, which are, in their worldview, that's kind of a, they're equivalent to the Sasquatch. You know, the oh, Sasquatch yeah. is more of the a tribe that's a little bit further down in British Columbia on Vancouver Island. They have the stories of the Zonaqua, you know, which is like the wild woman that steals kids and throws her in the basket. Sure. And there is a similar, but it's called the Sninic, and that's actually part of their creation myth. So they took us to these petroglyphs, and they said, you see that? Looks like an E.T. head. And it's this E.T. looking thing in a rock, and that apparently is the cosmic Sninic, and that was where the world came from in their in their worldview, you know? So okay. it's very interesting that this Sasquatch-like creature myth that they have is tied directly to kind of the birth of their, their world. So I think it goes to show that people groups across North America, whether they are, you know, kind of the original inhabitants or settlers and those that came afterwards all have these sorts of stories about very similar kind of creatures. I, I, and again, I do think there's a case of some of these stories that are not necessarily Sasquatch related being kind of cobbled in. Sure. Right. But largely a lot of the ones you hear about very, fit very well. I mean, the skunk ape kind of stuff, um, mm-hmm. big muddy monster in Illinois. Uh, there's so many of them that are, are kind of the local monster that once you are aware of this information fits very well with, contemporary sort of Sasquatch research. I I find it very interesting as, you know, as well, the, 
variable descriptions that are given in different regions. Like, and it makes me wonder, and I'm curious what your thought on this. Do you think, are we talking about maybe a collective branch? Or do you think that this is witness variability or, or testimony? They just noticed it differently. Or do you think that there is just that much biodiversity in how these things can appear um, that there might be tall, skinny, lanky, short, fat, uh, you know, the more primate looking versus the more man looking. Um, I've, I've certainly heard the spectrum of reports from witnesses yeah. as I'm sure you have, but do you think we're talking about different creatures or at least different branches of this same, you know, lineage, or is this just a biodiversity issue? It's a great question. The short answer is I have no clue. I don't sure. think anybody really <laughs> does. Otherwise, you know, we would probably have more facts, but in my opinion, and this is, you know, apparently nowadays controversial, I do believe that we're dealing with something that's kind of more of a flesh and blood type entity. Mm -hmm. um, I could be wrong. I, I'm fully willing to accept that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm open to other possibilities too, but I do believe that the precedent, what kind of makes more sense is that you have, again, I, going back to that behavior, talking about very similar types of behaviors that are being reported in extremely different ecological sort of niches, whether they be Southern swamps mm -hmm. or the Rocky mountains or the Appalachian mountains. And you're having basically the same types of behaviors being reported. I think that speaks to a, a, a consistency that we present in species. So, sure. um, you know, I know there's talks of people saying, Oh, there's three different, four different types of Sasquatches. And yeah. the only way I could, I guess, agree the way I see it is if you're talking about just how you have different subspecies of bears, I mean, you have black bears that are in certain areas have a more whitish for, I mean, there's in British Columbia alone. There's, uh, you know, driving through now, I saw two cinnamon black bear or cinnamon bears, which I've never seen before, which are black bears that apparently just have, you know, originally I thought it was a grizzly. And I said, no, no, this, the, the structure of the body looks very black bear. I mean, it's, you know, I have black bear here in New Hampshire and I get them even near my house. So I've seen a lot of them. Um, and I've seen black bear across North America and they generally look pretty similar, but British Columbia alone, you have the, the ghost bears or the spirit bears, which are these uh, like 20, 30 percent of black bears that have a white coat like mm -hmm. a polar bear. But they're they're fully a black bear. Then there's the Kermode bear, which has a bluish tint in the set in the sun. They're almost blue colored. And this is all within the province of British Columbia. And then you have, you know, these cinnamon bears and then regular black bears. So they're all the same animal. From what I understand, they can interbreed. They're not different species. They just have different adaptations for whatever reasons. Uh, you know, down I've I've seen black bears down in Florida. We tracked them, found footprints, and they're smaller and lankier mm. than bears that I've seen in more northern climates. And you have Bergman's rule: animals yeah. get larger the more north they go. The moose that I get here in my neck of the woods in New Hampshire are pretty big and intimidating. Don't get me wrong; you get cornered by one, it's not fun. <laughs> um, but you see the ones in Alaska, and it's you're looking at like a ice age monster in front of you, oh, yeah. bigger than your car. So. When it comes to Sasquatch, you know, I think there totally could be regional differences. I mean, if you live in a swamp, you're going to have different needs and adaptations than you would in a more mountainous, colder area where maybe, or in a place like Alaska, where you have a really short window of time to eat fresh things like berries and seeds and uh, mm -hmm. tubers and other things that you can, you know, gather. Whereas most of the year, you're probably going to be consuming meats uh, right. if you are an omnivorous type of animal. So I think what just makes the most sense to me is that we have this sort of uh, primate-like creature. I mean, I don't know how close, what's where they'd be to us in relations, but I think uh, it just seems to fit that mold better in terms of precedent. And the behaviors reported are behaviors we have in other primates. And I'm not saying that I think Bigfoot is on the level of a gorilla. You know, sure. Clearly, the, 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 the footprint shape alone would indicate something much closer to us in the, like, the hominology line and this is probably something Jeff Meldrum could speak to way better than I could <laughs> uh, as I'm not a scientist, but just kind of my inferred observations are that it just seems to make sense. That's the sort of precedent, you know, it's not like it's something like dog man, right? Where that has no biological precedent, right? You don't have upright canines. So that is a harder stretch to believe could be some sort of a natural thing, at least for me than say a Sasquatch, which makes sense. I and mean, when we know there's other species of human-like creatures. I mean, you've even got stuff like the Homo floresiensis or the Hobbit down in in, in Indonesia, you know, yeah. in the island of Flores in the 
some of those island communities that have stories of these creatures to this day, um, which it's like a perfect kind of analogy. Really interesting. Even stories in South Africa, you know, like uh, researcher Gareth Patterson, who I've had on, uh, who I've interviewed and, and gotten to interact with before talking about the Otang in South Africa. And, and South Africa is where the Australopithecines came from. And a lot of these early human kind of human hybrid type creatures came from that were bipedal, but covered in hair and lived without fire and tool use and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, just to kind of circle back to what I was talking about, it seems to be the precedent makes sense. And again, those behaviors reported, whether it be the vocalizations, the whooping, the the noises, I mean, primates are very vocal animals. If you've ever heard a howler monkey or a chimp or a gorilla at the zoo, that's, we are vocal. I mean, we are just the ones that have a different kind of ability to actually speak. But a lot of these other primates, they, have these behaviors. I mean, people report smell a lot of time with Sasquatch, which I don't think people hit on this point enough that, uh, you know, you've got stories like the skunk ape, of course, could be it lives in an environment where maybe it just is a bit more musky, but mm-hmm. smell is something that's reported in some encounters, but not all. But at, like, I wouldn't even say it's a majority of reports, but it is distinct enough. And I always get the same types of descriptions. People say really wet dog, rotting flesh, yeah. Uh, monkey house smell. I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard people say, well, it smelled like the monkey house at the zoo. <laughs> and and you know, gorillas can control their scent glands when they're upset or agitated. Mm-hmm. They can really, it's like if you were able to control your BO to, you know, uh, anger your neighbor or something like that. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have misused that, but you know, they, sure. they have that kind of control. So again, that's, that's something that, that is being reported that has an actual analogy in known fact, you know, or, or known animal behavior. So you have a lot of this sort of stuff. I mean, even some of the wood knocking and rock throwing stuff is stuff that we observed in chimps and other primates. And, and again, I'm not saying they are, these things are clearly have to be something vastly more intelligent than even primates and chimps. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it just kind of makes the most sense to me, at least when you look at it sort of broad picture. Now uh, there are obviously the more kind of paranormal aspects that are reported. And in my opinion, just I, I, again, I'm speaking from my personal experience, people I've talked to and my own experiences. That's really all I can sort of speak to with sure. extreme confidence. But a majority of the reports I've taken don't have any weirder elements to them. Right. Um, some do, and I'm not going to be one that's going to cherry pick and say, well, just because that doesn't fit my my perceived notion, it doesn't mean it's wrong. No. I mean, there are weirder things out there, right? I've seen UFOs and, and other strange things. And I know that there's more than just Sasquatch out there. I mean, the world's a very mysterious and weird place. Mm -hmm. Uh, Look at the UAP UFO stuff going on. I mean, clearly there's a lot going on (laughs) right now. Um, And, you know, you're into the ghost stuff. I'm not really into that, but I've had some kind of experiences like that. And and I do think there's something more than just this sort of flesh and blood that we uh, inhabit in our kind of 2D, 3D sort of worldview. But um, yeah, most of the Sasquatch reports tend to be along the lines of, uh, you know, it was crossing the road or I saw it in the backyard and it looked like a small turkey and then it stood up and I realized it was a smaller, you know, looked like a chimp kind of size, juvenile, sure. whatever. That's the majority of the sightings. And, and like I said, it's a minority that tend to have some of the weirder elements, but I don't discount them. I mean, even in my first ever episode of Bigfoot Beyond the Trail, the property owner that um, I was interviewing at the time, he, he had seen this glowing ball in the yard and then got a rock thrown at the screen in front of his face um, so I, you know, I don't know what to make of it, right? I'm not going right. to say one way or another. Um, I just can only speak from kind of uh, what I've been told and what I've experienced. So, um, you know, there could be something way weirder going on, very possible. But sure. you know, looking at the framework that that we have now, the precedent is there. And again, to kind of relate it back to that dog man thing, that is something that biologically doesn't make sense, right? Where a Sasquatch, you can actually see would probably have a place to fit in, and you know, gorillas and chimps are. are scantily known in the fossil record. I mean, there's right. almost no record of them existing because they look at the environments they live in, right? They live in these right. tropical jungles in Africa, and those are very terrible environments for the preservation of fossils. I mean, you've got things like the Gigantopithecus that really only exist because porcupines happened to drag certain parts of those bones into caves <laughs> and didn't eat the teeth bones, and that was in a perfect place to fossilize, and that's the only reason we know the largest ape in history ever existed. Yeah. Uh, so that that is, you know, that on itself is just an interesting kind of uh, case uh, with the Gigantopithecus. I know a lot of people in Sasquatch have talked about that. Sure. Um, I don't really lean that way. I think it'd be something more 
closer to humans than Gigantopithecus. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's all speculation. Like I said, if I knew the answers, I mean, <laughs> we'd probably be having a different conversation. But uh, so all I know is something is going on, right? right? There's something weird going on, stuff you can't explain, just the amount of eyewitnesses, uh, credible ones. Uh, sure. It's interesting. You know, also what I find really interesting is that this, it does appear to be a global phenomenon. Of course, there's the Yahweh's, the Aaron's, the, you know, the Woodwows, the, you know, uh, several different names around the world for what appear to be, at least on the surface, uh, a very similar creature. And there, and there may be differences. Like uh, with Yahweh's, they generally, uh, allegedly, according to people I've talked to in Australia, don't have as many of the peaked heads. They might have more rounded heads. Um, but what I find really interesting is that I, I'm sure that there's probably a common ancestor involved here, but they had dispersed around the face of the earth. Excuse me, hold on. However, they did. However, they did it. Whether it's the land bridge or or whatever, but they've been th- these pockets of uh, of creatures have been separate from each other for thousands, tens of thousands of years. And yet there's such a consistency in the behaviors, whether it's Australia, whether it's North America, whether it's China, you know, the, the reports that come in that you can nearly rubber stamp, you know, it could be from anywhere just based on behavior alone. And I find that absolutely fascinating that even with all that separation, all the thousands of years of development, they're essentially, and again, we don't know much, but they're essentially the same creature. I find that absolutely bizarre. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, you don't need to look further than just us human beings. I mean, you look at how diverse our species is in terms of uh, physical adaptations to the environments we live. I mean, Mm -hmm. almost no creatures in the world are more adapted to living in so many different harsh climates from the most hottest deserts to the coldest of places, like with the Inuits in in, in the Arctic region. I mean, it's unbelievable how widely spread we are and how... How that's affected, you know, the way we look, Mm -hmm. uh, skin color, all that kind of stuff, just these adaptations that, you know, you look at even in even like within Africa, you've got the Maasai warriors who are these huge kind of people in Kenya. And you can go across the continent to the the jungles there in the Congo and you have those pygmy tribes of people that are you know four or five feet tall. I mean, it's (laughs) such a and those, you know, those are all they're all Africans. but it's just such a difference in, you know, how people look, even within Europe, other places, Asia, too, just the adaptations. Um, so I think that's kind of an interesting example, because as you talked about earlier, uh, something that I kind of glossed over that I meant to talk about was the, the, the descriptions of Sasquatch being so varied. I mean, you get that really, mm-hmm. I've heard the very primate-like gorillas pronounced brow ridge, then the very human-like descriptions, very gentle features, or the mm-hmm. younger ones looking more primate-like than the, the older ones. Um, so that it's really interesting. Now, I mean, again, you look at just how different we as humans are. We we don't know. I mean, gorillas, chimps, other primates tend to look more uniform, as do most other animals. I mean, you can take most you can take a mountain lion from the Florida panther in Florida and compare it to a mountain lion in Washington State, and they're probably going to be more similar than they are different. Whereas you take a person from Africa, compare them to somebody from Sweden, they're going to look very different, right? Uh, and again, I think that's just kind of the environment, um, but maybe it has something to do with the way primates develop. I don't know, but we've never really, at least that we know of, have the chance to coexist with another sort of species. I mean, we have stories of the Neanderthal, right, and the, sure. the Denisovans, and supposedly a lot of people that are of, uh, I believe, Asian and European descent have more of that DNA than others. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, if Sasquatch, for example, has parallel evolved to us, I mean, it's clearly it doesn't want to be be around us all that much. So uh, what can we really draw from? But yeah, it does, it does puzzle me about the differences in descriptions, but again, maybe that's a regional thing. I know we talk about the South skunk ape. It seems to be shaggier and a little bit shorter in stature. And um, whereas the typical kind of Patty Patterson Gimlin type Sasquatch seems to have different characteristics. Um, It's, it's really intriguing. I mean, it just, it makes you wonder um, and then you have, you know, again, orang pendex, smaller creatures, larger creatures. Um, mm-hmm. Some of these stories from Alaska that I've heard recently just of massive creatures, 10 feet. I mean, 10 feet alone is is very impressive. I mean, something <laughs> 10 foot staying next to you, that's you're going to notice it for sure. So, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Again, but I think 
looking at the way we as humans have developed, uh, even though we exist in a sort of different space, we are we we don't live in the woods primarily. I mean, we're not hunter gatherers right. to the to the extent that we were even a couple hundred years ago mm-hmm. uh, as a society. So we've we've developed differently, but you look at how we are so varied. I mean, I've heard even stories uh, people talking about Sasquatches in in the same areas that well, one family group is more aggressive and the other one isn't. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe that's circumstantial. Doesn't necessarily have to do with. Uh, I guess it's you know, possible interaction with humans or whatever the case may be, but sure. uh, there seems to be a lot of variation across the board. I think that these are probably the most adaptable things on the planet. And a lot of people say, well, no people are. And I'm like, well, we are able to adapt our comfort wherever we are. Like we build structures, we build, you know, we build things to accommodate our comfort. Whereas these things can, can, they can be in the, in the jungle, they can be in swamps, they can be in mountains, they could be in the plains or, or the deserts. I mean, they're just found everywhere and, and seem to be not only surviving, but thriving. And I, I think that's a, an incredible testament to their adaptability. Would you agree? Yeah, I definitely would. I mean, just having been all across North America at this point and seeing the different types of environments that these things are reported to exist in and where we have reports coming out of, there seems to be, you know, as, as varied of terrain as you can get. But there does seem to be quite a few overlapping features, and those mm-hmm. tend to be you know, large areas with a lot of space, mm-hmm. with a lot of woods or swamp or whatever the case may be, water sources and a lot of different food sources. So, um, you know, you typically don't get as many reports from very urban areas of New Jersey or uh, (laughs) New York City or any of that kind of thing. It tends to be uh, from areas along the Appalachian Trail, talking about the East Coast. Or, uh, you know, Florida is uniquely interesting because you have these new developments popping up everywhere. And right across the street from a development, you have a swamp that's 50,000 acres that has Florida panthers and black bear and alligators. So you do have these reports in very suburban areas. I mean, even just thinking back to this past winter being uh, near the Everglades and we have a drive to Ochopee, which is the area that has had a lot of sightings of skunk apes in the past. And uh, there was one report that we looked into of a guy from, I think, 2021 who had a sighting. And he describes he lives in this new development that's kind of on this marina right where uh, you have the ocean. So a lot of people have their little canals in Florida where they have boat access and they have manatees regularly swimming up to their house. But he's like, I've seen bears walking down my street. I've seen Florida panthers. We've had gators in the pool. The whole Florida experience, right? He sure. says, well, this one night they happened to, it was after it was raining and he was hearing this like flapping on this road. And he says this, this, hairy man-like creature ran underneath the streetlight in his neighborhood. So, you know, for him, he was accustomed to seeing creatures in his property, even though it was a brand new, you know, million dollar development or whatever. Sure. They would see all this kind of stuff because they happen to be bordering in an area where you have uh, a state forest that connects to the almost three plus million acres of protected federal land. That's the big Cypress preserve in the Everglades national park where you have you know, hundreds of bear and panther roaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for him, it was just weird. But, uh, you know, it was, it was not weird to see animals, but it was weird to see whatever this thing was and the way he described it. So, um, yeah, I think just so many different areas that these things exist in. And then, as I mentioned, driving to Alaska, just seeing the amount of space there and checking some of the sightings that have happened there. And so many of them happen to just be road crossing or oh, hunters found footprints up here. But, again, you just go off 10 miles in off of the road and you're in – the most remote place you could possibly imagine. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's just so much space for anything to be there. Right. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. I, I think that one thing this is both maybe encouraging and frustrating to me. And, and that is, I think that this subject is now more popular than ever. And I think that's good because I think if people are going to be going to wild places like to, you know, parks or whatever, they, they do have a right, in my opinion, to know what's out there and what may be out there. And so I'm glad that the awareness is raised. But I think it's it's also encouraged, I don't know, probably a lot of 
um, irresponsible. I, it may be the best way to put it. I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to be judgmental at all, but but I think that there's a lot of enthusiasts now to this topic, and it's becoming it's it's well not becoming but it's been just kind of a, a maelstrom of ideas and 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 theories and and opinions and and combative even between different yeah. you know quote unquote factions and that that to me is frustrating. How, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, I deal with this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the frustrations. I mean, I at the end of the day, I, I I try to just kind of do my own thing and focus on my own work because uh, you'll you'll the endless Facebook debates about. Uh, the apers versus the woo. I mean, that's big now and the paranormal stuff and everyone's at each other's throats and there, there's no really Bigfoot community. Right. I think something I've noticed, uh, one of the biggest problems I've seen is that because you have no established facts, I mean, you have the closest thing to facts you have are, Oh, this is what John Green said, or sure. Je- this is what Jeff Meldrum thinks. Right. So you have some sort of kind of central figures, mm-hmm. um, but the thing is, anybody can show up and just make something up, and then they right. become, you know, they get a lot of subscribers, and guess what? They're now a credible source, even though they are talking about the Bluff Creek Massacre or any other kind of Looney Tune thing that they might have just invented five minutes ago, yeah. and they gain traction, and then you have new people that come in, and a lot of the things I get a lot is you'll see these hoaxes that have been debunked ten times over, and every couple of years, it'll be like a cheesy photo of a guy in a gorilla suit on the shoreline of a lake, and it says, <laughs> yeah. oh, well... This police department in Alabama says that they're right. squash sighting and, you know, they're, they're clearly doing kind of tongue in cheek sort of thing. Yeah. And then 10 people will send that to me and say, well, I've already seen this thing five years ago. Right. Out it. And that kind of happens. And I think that's, again, I think due to the fact that anybody can really come in and just make anything up. And that's the problem. <laughs> that's why I really try to stick mostly to my own experiences and what people have told me. I mean, obviously I draw from a wealth of, uh, Literary knowledge, I think, that is on the subject, and I think there there was more of a responsibility with it, or not responsibility, more of a um, serious way of of looking at the topic mm-hmm. back in the day. I think people writing books and some of the earlier folks that got into it really took it quite seriously. And sure. but there was still conflict then. I mean, none sure. of the old four horsemen kind of liked each other either, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> and there's always been egos and things getting in the way. And now people have an incentive to you know, go viral on TikTok. So they right. steal a clip from the Sierra sounds and put it over their hunting video. And then that blows up and they get a million <laughs> views. And so it's like, how do you navigate this? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I just say for myself and, you know, again, this is a guy online who's looking for Sasquatch. So take what I say with a grain of salt as well. Um, but I just kind of say, if anyone is speaking in absolutes, you know, who, who speaks in absolutes? Only a Sith, right? So, <laughs> so um, no, but I think, you know, people that come into it and say, well, this is absolutely a fact or mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're necessarily there yet. I mean, we again, we have like the experiences that I've had. I never say are 100 percent Sasquatch because I could sure. prove them wrong. They just tend to fit the purported behaviors that have been described in, in, in the consistency. And when we talk about just a mass of eyewitness sightings and plotting sure. behaviors and seeing, you know, uh, stuff like wood knocking and, and other things that seem to be associated with it. Yeah. That's kind of fits in there. So it, it's difficult. It's a very difficult landscape to navigate. I think probably more so difficult now than it's ever been because of the internet. Uh, I think even I remember just 10, 15 years ago when it was kind of getting big on social media, it was still a little easier to navigate, you know, mm-hmm. but now it's just, it's just taken off. And the amount of stuff I get sent daily of hoaxes that I've known about for years, stuff that's been debunked gets frustrating, but I, yeah. I just try to do my own thing. And like I said, I try to focus on my own work and, yeah. um, you know, because you can get frustrated and I've had, I've been burned out of the topic too, because of stuff sure. like this. And I know plenty of people who got so frustrated, they gave up. And even if they've had real experiences and, and, you know, gotten the chance to go out and do research and, and believe or have had a sighting, but they distance themselves from the topic because of all the sure. shenanigans and everything yeah. going on. Yeah. So uh, I, I understand, I totally understand the frustrations and there's, you know, it's like a million people speaking at the same time, but it's all gibberish. It's like, <laughs> how, how do you pick, which one do you pick to trust? And right. I don't know. it's, it's, it's a, like uh, trying to walk through a minefield, I guess, just uh, <laughs> sure. it's not easy for sure. And now the new AI images that are out there with the 15 oh, foot man. Sasquatch, Next to like the miner up in the mountains and stuff. Well, even yeah, that particular photo. I mean, I had a bunch of people send it to me, and even uh, I think it was Reuters or something like that put out a uh, 
a statement saying this is an AI image. I mean, you know, yeah. a lot of people don't trust the mainstream media anymore. But this was just, you know, clearly anybody can tell if you've had an experience with AI, this was AI created. I just found it interesting that a kind of mainstream source yeah. issued a statement about a Bigfoot photo, which is not something you'd normally see. But yeah. I think that has deeper implications than beyond just Bigfoot and the paranormal with AI and oh, sure. uh, you know, the deep fakes and all that kind of stuff yeah. that uh, are are something that's absolutely going to become part of our reality now, whether we like it or not. It's just, yeah. you know, it used to be when Photoshop came around, people were like, oh, my God, over for Sasquatch, <laughs> CGI images. And now it's like, well, hey, we got AI. Yeah. yeah, you don't even have to sit down and do it. You just tell it what to do. Exactly. But it was funny when they first when they first showed up, there was no backstory at all. It's just these incredibly, you know, old, uh, what are they called, sepia toned pictures yep. that look antique. And it's like people are just ready to get on that bus. They were ready to ride it. It's like, wait a minute, where where did this come from? How it was it's what I like to call the orgy of evidence. It's like really yeah. you know, it's they use that term in, in homicide investigating when something looks right. staged. It's like, where did it come from? How how does the story well then about a month later, these backstories, oh, it was found in a jar buried in a yard in Alabama or something. It's like no, no, it wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's and that's the thing I think is part of it too is that there is people are starved for good evidence. Oh sure. Um, I think I don't think there's a lot of great Sasquatch evidence out there. There's a lot no. more hoaxes and fakes, and I think there are legitimate pieces of evidence. Mm-hmm. It's like diamonds in the rough sort of thing. There is great stuff out there. You really have to seek it out yeah. and know kind of the backstory a little bit in a lot of the cases when it comes to photographic and videographic evidence, at least. Sure. And it, the good stuff, in my opinion, is pretty scant. Sure. Um, I, I think that's largely based on kind of the the mo of Sasquatch, right? I mean, it's not something that really sticks around for photos, right. but yeah. I think because people are so starved for that sort of thing, that they'll lash on anything, and I think that really gets abused by hoaxers and mm-hmm. others that are hoping to uh, fool the public. I mean, there's plenty of channels and people that do these sorts of things where they create, you know, they have one suit, and that's just oh, this was a photo that came out of Bluff Creek, and this one was out of uh, Michigan, and they just use the same suit and recycle it, and people <laughs> maybe will just see that one photo and they right. latch onto that. So, right. yeah, it's extremely frustrating. I don't blame people for getting fed up with it and sure. focusing it on a on a kind of their own level instead of trying to even engage with some, kind of some of the online stuff. But sure. um, the waters are as muddy as ever, and I think <laughs> all you can really do is do your own sort of thing and yeah. work with people you trust and just try to have fun with it. I think at the end of the day, if you get out in the woods – and, you know, put down the computer and the phone for a little bit and get out in the woods mm-hmm. and just enjoy nature. I think that's a big part of it. At least, yeah. I mean, I know with my series, I try to inspire people and mm-hmm. showcase some of the nature and some of the areas that, you know, we get to go to that because those are the places that uh, really are an authentic experience. That's not an right. AI image, that right. mountain you see looming above you <laughs> or that that swamp in front of you. That's not AI created. That is that is reality. That right. is absolutely reality. And if people can gain an appreciation for that, I think that's that's a wonderful thing. So, um, you know, a lot of times Bigfooting is glorified camping. I mean, let's be real. So if you can get out camp with your friends, like there's nothing wrong with that, I mean, unless you guys get into an argument. But uh, that's, that's normal human stuff, right? But yeah. just have fun with it. Don't, some people take it really too seriously. But uh, I think we need to kind of just take a little bit of a step back maybe. I think you're right. And, you know, getting back to the the whole evidence thing, I think it's it's inversely a problem as well because I think – there is very possibly and probably some amazing evidence out there that'll never see the light of day because who wants to jump into that tank, you know? Um, yes. Because I think with all this crap, it's it's created experts everywhere. Just ask them. Everybody's an expert. And and the, the attacks are actually really brutal if you read some of the threads. And some of them, I think, got it coming, you know, but... Uh, when it's clearly not legitimate or there's, you know, it's been a known hoax and people are still trying to perpetuate it. But then there's the other side of it where, well, I mean, if I had a great trail cam image of a Bigfoot, I would, I, I would put it out there just because it's what I do. But right. I would, you know, I'd be putting on my Kevlar underwear too, because I know people are going to be coming in for a, for a little, little taste. Well, same here. I mean, even, you know, times where we've had stuff that is questionable and we'll put it out there and, uh, you know, you fully expect people to go off on it, and that's just part of it. I mean, we could get the most crystal HD footage tomorrow, and I don't think it's really going to make much of a difference at all in sure. terms of proof. Like, oh, of course the guys that look for Sasquatch got footage of one, right? And then, you know, you have the community will tear – well, the community. People start tearing it apart. And I know people who have 
come out with their stories of their sightings or even, you know, alleged mm-hmm. video and photo evidence they have, and it gets torn apart and they wish they never even said anything right. about it. I mean, that's, that's the unfortunate aspect. So sure. um, just people with eyewitness stories too, I think that's a big part of our getting ridiculed or even being abused by uh, major networks uh, mm-hmm. had their story twisted in a way or made fun of and that sort of thing that uh, a lot of people end up sort of not wanting to really talk about it again. They internalize it or whatever the case may be. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's definitely one of those things that you kind of like, Oh, if I got this, would I release it I, again myself like you? I, I definitely would just because sure. that's sort of what, what I do, what is what we do. But mm-hmm. I totally understand why people don't want to. And I have had multiple instances where I've been shown a footprint, alleged footprint or alleged photo that the person says, you know, just don't film this. Please don't make it public. Don't release yeah. it. And, you know, I respect that. Absolutely. I wouldn't, wouldn't do that sure. without someone's uh, blessing, but I understand, you know, they don't want that the craziness to kind of come at them. Um, yeah. Even if it's something that's pretty decent. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I think I, I really do have to commend you on, on your approach because having watched so many of your episodes and in, in how you're presenting it, you're never trying to sell anybody anything. And, and I like that about how you do it. It's, there's so much integrity with your presentation and, and with just being absolutely transparent with it. This is what we found. We think it could be this, but it might be this and it may not be. And and I always really respected that because you're not selling people on sensationalism. You're taking people on a journey and it's beautifully done. Your work is, is incredibly well shot. It's really well edited and, and it tells a story. Every one of your episodes really tells a story, which, which is why I'm hooked and why I can't, I can't ever wait for your next ones. Uh, I've just been a, just really enjoying what you're doing, brother. I appreciate that. Yeah. And it's, I think part of it is too, people, you know, you can't make everybody happy. A lot of people complain about this. They complain about that. You're never going to make everyone happy. Right. If you can make yourself happy with it. And like, this is the story I want to tell. Um, because yeah, we try to do a lot of the boots on the ground sort of research and we'll tell you exactly what happened. Like Nothing happened. But here's, you know, enjoy the journey along the way. That's part of it, too, is the journey is right. part of it. You know, the travel is to be able to see some of these locations. I mean, I received some of the most amazing messages of people that, you know, are paralyzed or they have health issues mm-hmm. and they can't get out in the woods anymore. And they live vicariously kind of tr- through some of the journeys we take. And that, that's great. I mean, if I can inspire anyone to just have a more positive outlook in this sort of crazy mm-hmm. negative world we live in, right, that, that to me is rewarding. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think when it comes to the kind of the integrity aspect of it, and not to get on a high horse at all, but I think it definitely holds true. I mean, in this topic especially, I think with a lot of these sorts of folkloric kind of paranormal topics, all you really have is your integrity. Right. And the moment the moment you kind of compromise on that, I think that really that will affect you later on. So uh, just trying to be transparent about everything, and um, I don't think the sensationalism needs to be there. Frankly, I think right. a lot of the what people are used to, and this is really unfortunate, um, people are used to being lied to by sure. either major networks or people who are unscrupulous who just want clicks and views or they just want eyeballs on their um, network TV show. Yeah. Yeah, they're used to, oh, every time the camera's on, something's going on. You know, Because sure. you've got somebody who is not into Bigfoot that runs that show that is doing the story and, and all the uh, editing for that that you know, they're not – they're going to make it look like, well, there's a Bigfoot right there. They're not, they don't care. They just want people to be interested. So I think that's a difference. Like with small town monsters, what we've been able to do, which I've been really thankful for is just the the ability to tell these stories, but in a way that I think we all are primarily cryptid enthusiasts and people that are into these things. So it's like, how would I want this to be portrayed? I don't want to be lied to. I don't want them to tell me, guess what? You know, we, we were in the super remote location and find out, well, actually we're, on some sort of exclusive uh, ranch or something like that. I mean, it's disappointing, you know, sure. without going into any specifics. But I think people are just, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the, the vitriol and stuff that, that we get criticized for is because I think people are so conditioned to being lied to about these topics. Mm. And, and again, this is not to be on a moral high horse. I just think it's just like, hey, be better. Just tell the truth. I mean, how is that so difficult? Yes. Is it going to be easier if you just say, well, I just got the best Bigfoot footage on earth. Right. Of course, you're probably going to get that 15 minutes of fame and you'll go viral. But then once that's done, you've alienated a large part of people who probably watched your stuff or right. know about you automatically, anything you do in the future, you're going to get that sort of hate. So you can either then 
apologize and own up to it or go on the defensive. And uh, we see plenty of examples of, of that kind of thing. So I think, again, it comes down to all you really have is your integrity. And if you're willing to compromise on that, then, um, you know, a lot of people are. And that's that's fine. That's their choice. I mean, I'm sure. not, again, I'm not trying to sound like I'm trying to lecture. I really hope that's no, no. not how this is coming across. It's just, <laughs> this is just the way I see it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, the world is crazy enough as it is. And, and a lot of people look to these topics as a sort of escape. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm happy to provide that in some aspects, you know, again, sure. being able to being so incredibly blessed to be able to go to places like Alaska or Bluff Creek or uh, any of these sort of locations and just share that and bring people along. I mean, right. um, you know, even, even if it's not for the Bigfoot stuff, just being able to showcase how incredible the world is. Yeah. Um, people hopefully don't lose sight of that, but uh yeah, well, we're often so caught up in the rat race that it's like, well, <laughs> look at what is around us. I mean, right. it's amazing. Yeah, you're in amazing locations and stuff. So I know we're getting to the the end of our discussion, but I got to ask you, what's your scariest time investigating this stuff? Is there oh, one one thing that really sticks out? It's a good question. I've never really had anything happen that I would say was super life threatening. I mean, we are in a lot of situations where you do Ooh. have dangerous animals and. Sure. Probably dealing with people. I mean, is you get some weird folks out there in the woods that sometimes, <laughs> you know, you get weird people everywhere. I, I honestly feel safer out in the middle of the woods than I do in, in a big city. Sure. At least current day and age. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, you, people are weird everywhere. You run into some strange folks. But, gosh, I mean, in terms of danger, I guess, you know, we had this one time where we were in a Mount Hood area in Oregon, Mount Hood National Forest, and we went to this amazing location that was in Joe Bielart's book, The uh, Oregon Bigfoot Highway, I believe is the title. I have it in my bookshelf. Um, I forget the exact title. It's a fantastic book. Joe Bielart's one of these old school researchers. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were there with kind of Cliff Berrickman and some of his guys um, from the North American B- Bigfoot Center, his museum there sure. in the Mount Hood area. And we went to this area of a sighting that was in Joe's book about this guy who had been fishing by this riverbank by, um, with his kids, and this Sasquatch kind of came out really aggressively and was trying to push them out of the area. And they, he had a fishing rod, and this Sasquatch was, like, pushing him. He was using the fishing rod to keep it at bay, and it was, like, pushing with its hand to get him out of there. Wow. So we're like, oh, this would be a great spot. Let's go there. We go there. We set up camp. We notice there's another truck in the area. It's kind of like an old... Uh, there's a bridge there that was in terrible shape, but it's like a forest service sort of road. Mm-hmm. And there was just this weird kind of event that transpired then. And you know, we have our camp set up and we're all hanging out on the road above the camp. because It's kind of like the road is above it. And a couple of us are up by one of these guys' trucks and just kind of hanging out. And all of a sudden this dude walks out of the woods wearing this weird, he was like lanky, skinny looking with this golden vest on, these weird black kind of pants, shorts. And he was kind of shocked to see us. We just kind of waltzed by us. He was going for a evening stroll in the middle of nowhere, mind you. <laughs> Not like you're in someone's neighborhood, like, oh, there's somebody walking. Right. We're all kind of flabbergasted looking, like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> and one of, one of the guys there, one of Cliff's guys, mutters, uh, going, for an, going for an evening walk. And the guy's like, oh, yeah. And he just keeps walking. And he walks by, and he's like, there's nothing down that way. Like, we don't know what he's going to. Ooh. And then it starts getting dark. It was a little weird. We had we had got a film because one of the guys had dash cam on his truck. <laughs> that was weird. And then I figure out, well, actually, once the darkness kind of set, we could see down towards the river. We could hear people. And we saw these, like, tiki torches in a circle set up. And we're like, that's kind of strange. And I started walking around camp, and I noticed there's these trails. And I think what happened was when you're up on the road, you can look down into that particular campsite we were, which is not like an official campsite. It was literally just a patch of area where there's like a fire pit. That was it. Uh You can see into the camp from above, but we can't see up at the road if you're walking by. I think he was circling around to try to just scout us out, see what was going on. Uh But we see this sort of weird ritual type thing going on, and there's tiki torches. And we looked into the truck that was parked there, and they had a pentagram Ooh. And uh, animal bones hanging that were painted different colors and golden, <laughs> and so it was it was kind of some red flag type stuff. And we're yeah. like, you know, maybe we'll go to a different location. <laughs> so I wouldn't say that was dangerous. It was just a weird kind it's of creepy. encounter. Yeah, honestly, more of the dangerous stuff that's happened is being out in the backcountry and you know uh, being in the edge of a cliff. And if if you fall down there, I mean, it's you're done. pretty much done. It's yeah. over. Yeah, I mean, no one. 
your buddies are going to see you die and that's it. Or being out in Alaska and being many, many um, hours from hospital, essentially boat, blow boat or helicopter ride. I mean, it would sure. run through the gamut. So luckily we've never had anything crazy happen. We did have a, actually down in Louisiana this past winter, I had interaction with a um, cottonmouth snake, Ooh. which is one of the venomous in North America. I was out there with Scott of the Bigfoot Mapping Project, great guy and a great project. Um, and we were out in Louisiana. We'd paddled into the Atchafalaya Swamp area and we're looking for, you know, kind of stuff in the swamp area. And he's like, hey, look over there. And you see this little white thing sticking out from the water and it's just the little fangs in the mouth. You realize why they're called a cottonmouth. That's a close call, you know, yeah. that we, we were safe distance. So we got to film it and take pictures of it from five or six feet away. So we were even further than that, maybe we were, we were good, but yeah, you got to realize your mortality. I mean, there's weird stuff out there. There's a lot more than Bigfoot that's threat in North American woods. So uh, <laughs> prepare accordingly, I suppose. Yeah. Wow. Well, Alex, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you, brother. I, and like I said, I've been, a fan for a long time and I've really enjoyed your work and I look forward to part two of your Alaska experience coming up. When are you going to release that? There's going to be a lot coming. I've got like a couple terabytes of footage. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's pretty wild. So uh, there's going to be an entire series dedicated to that area, a quote unquote, which sure. is the sort of um, covered in the Alaskan coastal Sasquatch. So that'll be, a little different. I think it's going to be much more of like a video journal sort of thing, mm-hmm. day, day by day sort of occurrences and just what it's like being out there. Yeah. Um, whereas Bigfoot Beyond the Trail will continue. There's going to be about three or four Alaskan Bigfoot Beyond the Trails, and that'll just be kind of rolling out August and then into the fall. And um, there's a lot there. So there's I can tell you one of them will be the Alaska Bigfoot Highway, which will be my whole drive from basically – uh, the start of the Alaska Highway in British Columbia up to Alaska because, uh, you know, there's just a lot of Bigfoot stories along there, and, mm. and I'm really excited to put that one together because I think it'll be, uh, you know, an awesome road trip, but it's also going to have a lot of Bigfoot history and both on the Canadian and the U.S. sides of that border um, wow. and some fantastic researchers and people I got to interview along the way. So that'll be fun. So, yeah, I guess just coming forward in August, September, and that sort of thing. Well, it's been a rare pleasure, brother. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. Awesome discussion. I like getting into some of that anthropological stuff. You know, a lot of times people just want to talk about the experiences and that sort of thing. But sure. uh, you know, trying to figure out what these things are is, is right. a big part of it. We don't know. I mean, there's something going on. That's the only thing I know, really. Yeah. Uh, something is going on, whether it's all in our minds or it's real. Um, you know, it seems to be something. So. Yeah, I know our imaginations don't leave prints, so that's a good Yes, or throw, or throw rocks at you in the middle of the night in Alaska. That one's <laughs> tough for me to wrap my mind around. Yikes. Well, thank you again, brother, and I uh, hope you'll come back another time Keep to keep this dialogue going, man. Anytime. All right, take care. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap it up for us today. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show, and thank you again so much for all your love and support. Remember, if you want to follow the Paranormal Portal, probably the easiest way is to head over to paranormalportal.net, and that's the homepage for the Paranormal Portal, and you'll find links to all of our different social media and uh, sites and information about the shows, including our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash paranormal portal, or just look for Paranormal Portal on, on Google or whatever search engine, and you'll find links to our social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and uh, Twitter. So we're kind of all over the place, and we're spreading this as well as we can. But anyway, thank you so much for the love and support. Y'all take care, and remember, we love y'all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Nice. Take care of each other, help each other out, find the magic in every day, and remember to laugh as much as you can. Until next time. Well, the only time she really turned with that famous yep. was when I rode across the creek and got down off the horse. She turned to look at me.